Welcome to our fourth module, which is dedicated to the dihedral subgroup problem. In this lecture, we will discuss the, uh, the problem of groups and subgroups and, and how they relate to the hidden subgroup problem. Groups are just sets that are equipped with a law, which here we denoted multiplicatively, such that each pairs of elements of a group G is uh, their product or their, uh, their, their operation through uh, the law is uh, still in G. In addition, uh, we require that there be a neutral element, which is an element such that when you multiply it uh, you know, from the left or from the right to any element in G, this leaves the element uh, to which you've multiplied it unchanged. Also, we, um, uh, we uh, require that for every A in G, there be an inverse. So uh, that means that it's a B such that A times B is B times E, uh, B times A and e equals to um, the neutral element. And finally, something that sometimes can be problematic is we require associativity, which means that if we have three elements to multiply, um, we can do it in whatever order we want. So we can multiply A by B by C by first multiplying B by C and then the result by A, or we can multiply A by B and then multiply by C, okay? Now, uh, there are very simple groups. For example, Z, the, 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 the set of integers equipped with the addition is a group. Uh, you can verify that all the essential properties are satisfied, right? The sum of two integers is also an integer. Then that you have that uh, a minus a is equal to zero, which plays the role here of the neutral element. Okay, and so in the end, you have a plus b plus c is always equal to a plus b then plus c okay so you have many examples of groups here of course i'm giving you uh the sort of the most simple one that comes to mind now one thing that one notion that is going to be very important for the hidden sub column is obviously the notion of subgroup so what is a subgroup in a nutshell is just a group inside a group okay so there's a couple things for a subset of a given group to be a subgroup, there's just a couple properties that we need to verify. So we need to have that the subgroup is not empty, that uh, every uh, pairs of elements of the subgroup, when you multiply them together, you stay in the subgroup. And finally, that you need that for every element in the subgroup, that's inverse must be in the subgroup as well. So examples, of subgroups. For example, um, for subgroups of Z plus, that all of the form R times Z for a certain R, okay? And the subgroups of congruence classes modulo N are of the form um, uh, R times uh, the, uh, the, 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 ring, the, the set of congruence classes, okay? Now, we will meet the concept of cosets. For, um, um, uh, to, to explain what the hidden subgroup problem is. So a group, now we have a group G and a subgroup H, and then we'll call a, uh, so here I say it's a left coset that I'm giving you. A coset is a set of the form, of all the elements of the form G times an element in H. So that is the left coset containing G, and we always talk about a coset of a particular subgroup, okay? So here we have that it's the set of X's in G such that X is of the form G times H for some H, okay, in, in, uh, in the subgroup. So a very important example of a coset, which we're already familiar with, is the congruence classes. So if I look at uh, the, the group of integers and the subgroup of the form n times c, then uh, the coset a plus h, note that here we're denoting things additively because the, um, the law is just uh, uh, the addition, 
then the coset A plus H is simply the congruence class of A modulo N. Okay? Now, what we will need then is to look at what those cosets, the kind of structure that they have. Okay, so the, for now we've just we've described them just as sets, but in fact they have if the subgroup is uh, is what we call normal and what we're going to define in a minute, then what will happen is that in fact the cosets form themselves a group. So for for that to happen, we need the subgroup to be normal which means that for every G and every H, we need to have, apologies, we need to have that the property that GH, G inverse is in H. So what it means, uh, uh, otherwise um, uh, stated, is that uh, H is stable by conjugation by elements of G, okay? Now, this property, which would denote by H normal uh, in G uh, uh, implies directly that uh, the set of cosets is in fact a group where the um, the the law between so the the the, the law uh, between the the between cosets is induced by the law that between the elements of G. Okay, so we we define the product of two cosets. In, in the uh, most natural way, which is the cosets uh, containing a the product of a representative of each of the cosets, okay? So we say here that, of course, the elements G2 and G1, they're representatives of the cosets uh, modulo H uh, that they define, okay? And so this law is well-defined as long as we have that uh, H is normal. So let's work this out on an example. First, let's verify that H is normal into G. Well, we assume that H is in H and G is in G. And what do we have? We have that G plus H plus G inverse, which is really, we're talking about doing minus G here is equal to h and therefore is in h. So there is no problem with that, that uh, we have uh, the stability, stability by conjugation. Now, if I look at an element of g quotient by h, what I'm really looking at is, of course, uh, I'm looking at a congruent class, modulo n. So if I have a, plus b, what I'm doing is I'm doing a plus nz plus b plus nz. And by definition, this is going to be a plus b plus nz. Okay, and this is well defined. And this is how we define the addition between congruence classes. Now, Let's see how this all relates to the hidden subgroup problem. So uh, this is a very important framework. Here we're phrasing in a sort of a very uh, generic way, but we're gonna be interested, of course, in only very simple cases. So in particular, uh, a lot of cases, we look at uh, commutative groups, although the dihedral group, as we'll see in the next lectures, is not commutative, but very close to being one. And then another thing is, of course, we often, uh, very often, in fact, uh, focus on finite groups, okay? So here I'm sort of giving you only a very generic description of what the hidden subgroup problem is about, but then we'll be interested in only very specific instances of it, okay? So let's G be a group and H be a uh, subgroup, which is normal into G. And X a set, I'm not saying much about X. And, and assume that we have a function from g at x that is constant on the coset set. So it means that if g1 and g2 are in the same coset, then it must be that f is, uh, evaluates to uh, the same value in x. But on the other hand, if the cosets are different, we require 
that uh, the function uh, maps them to two different elements in X. The goal uh, of the problem, so we solve the problem if we can find the, the group H given access to the possibility of, uh, of evaluation, evaluating F. Okay, so here we got like a little uh, a description of what it does. It maps every coset. So the coset, of course, so partition G and every coset, the, all the elements are mapped to uh, the same uh, element in X. So for example, G1, H here, everybody must be mapped under F by uh, to X1. So um, here, um, of course, we haven't quite uh, presented Shor's algorithm as a hidden subgroup problem. I mean, Shor's algorithm as, a, as an algorithm to solve the hidden subgroup problem. But we can sort of recast the quantum factoring problem into the problem of finding uh, a subgroup. Okay, so let's see uh, uh, briefly here how this works. Remember that we solve our problem of factoring if we find R, which is the order of A modulo N. Okay, now it turns out that H equals RZ is, of course, a subgroup of Z. We've mentioned that before. Okay, so now the question is what are, uh, what, what, how does F? map every different uh, coset uh, modulo H, okay? So we need to argue here that F is constant on the same coset and F maps a, a different cosets to different values. So first, let's assume here that, um, uh, let's say uh, X1 is congruent to X2 modulo uh, modulo uh, RZ, which again is the same thing as saying that, apologies, X1 plus RZ is equal to X2 plus RZ, okay? So now, how does this uh, translate into the evaluation of, of F? So F of X1 is going to be equal to A to the x1 mod n, and that is going to be equal to a to the x2 plus some multiple of n modulo n, and that is going to be a to the x2 mod n, because a to the r is congruent to 1 mod n. So what it means is this is equal to f of x2. Okay, so what we have is if they're the same modulo n, x1 and x2, then f evaluates the same value. On the other hand, if we do not have that x1 congruent to x2 mod, n, mod, R, mod rz, then what we will have is that f of x1, okay, which is a to the x1 mod n and f of x2 is a to the x2 mod n and what happens here is that a to the x1 minus x2 mod n is not equal to 1 okay so what it means is we do not have that these two values are the same because it, for this to happen, for this thing to be equal to one, we would have had to have R divides X1 minus X2, okay? Which is not happening because we just said that by hypothesis, X1 is not congruent to X2. So what it means here is that F1, uh, sorry, F of X1 is different than F of X2. And so in the end, what we have is that we map uh, different cosets to different values of a to the x mod n, and we map the co each element of a coset to the same value, okay? So then we are exactly in the framework of the hidden subgroup problem. Now, we have not been um, uh, presenting it that way, and in particular, because our control group was not z, 
Okay, we could not, and like I said before, I mentioned that we were into the most simplest case, the simplest cases were the ones where we were dealing with finite groups. And it turns out to, to be able to do that, we had to mod out by a, 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 two to, a modulo two to the n for some uh, number of qubit uh, small n that had to be uh, um, calculated to be large enough for certain things to happen. So of course, this is not quite how we described Shor's algorithm, but this illustrates the fact that the, the, the framework of the hidden subgroup problem is a very powerful one. It, in, it implies, uh, it, 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 it allows us to solve a lot of very important computational problem. Okay, so in the next lecture, what we will see is how we can uh, leverage this framework in order to, uh, to solve the hidden subgroup problem in the dihedral group. Thank you.